Welcome back to the Campus Ministry Today podcast, sponsored by Via Students. I'm just one of your hosts, Steve Shadrach. The other one is Clayton Bullion, uh, my close friend and co-worker. And we want to thank you for joining us today. We're honored to have you, whether you're watching or listening, whatever platform you're on, we're, we're thrilled to have you. And, but we want to come alongside you and your ministry to help equip you, encourage you, to serve you as you share the gospel, as you make disciples as you mobilize students to the nations. That's kind of what the whole purpose of this podcast is, this every other year conference that we've kicked off called EDM. It, it stands for Evangelism, Disciple Making, and Missions Mobilization. We think those are the three components of the Great Commission. How do we help the collegiate body of Christ stay on this, this Great Commission road and not get off on any exit, perhaps any ditches, but stay focused on person and purposes of Jesus Christ here on earth. So that's really why we do this. We're thrilled to have Steve Addison with us. This is part three of a three part conversation that we've had with Steve Addison. And he has uh, written so many great books on the concept of, of movements uh, that we've talked about in previous episodes. So Steve, thank you for, for being uh, with us on this little podcast journey. And um, just for those that maybe um, haven't had a chance to listen to the other two podcasts and maybe just listening to this one, Steve, um, give us a, a one minute capsule, if you would, a kind of about who you are, what your life is about. If you Sure. Well, I was a young church planter when God got a hold of me in the second year of the church plant. We were, we were good Baptists, so we had a big church fight and, um, uh, out of that, God got my attention about, Steve, it's not just one church, uh, it's a whole new generation of churches that uh, are going to reach nations. And and I needed to see broader. Uh, and God brought blessing and peace to that church after I'd learned my lesson, uh, and, and he clarified the call. And that's the journey I've been on ever since, both as a as a practitioner, but I'm also uh, probably more than others. I'm I'm a reflective practitioner, so I I like to learn not just from what I'm doing, but from the scriptures, from history, and from people around the world who are pursuing movements of disciples and churches to the glory of God. Um, so that's that's me in a nutshell. Well, I it, it, there's so much more to you, and I'm gonna pick up from last episode with a particular question before Clayton jumps in and has a, a question for you, Steve. But for our listeners, for those who are watching or listening, uh, Steve Addison has written several books, uh, I think probably at least five. And um, I brag on you a lot. I quote you a lot, Steve, because I'm not sure there's anybody on the planet who has really done as thorough a job in the scriptures to help us truly understand not only what Jesus did, what Paul did, but why they did it? What what was their mm. what, what what was their vision? What was their strategy? You know, why did they go to this town? Why did they go to this people group? Why did they teach this? And so he really connects the dots in, in such in depth ways, uh, biblically, historically, that is just fascinating. So go to Amazon.com, find the Steve Allison books. Get those, read them, take small groups through them. Uh, they're, they're just powerful and fascinating and really forms an incredible biblical foundation for how we can be and should be engaged in the Great Commission ourselves. And those become the model. That becomes the template for us. So thank you, Steve, for all your work. Thank you for your writings. We're honored to have you today. And uh, what I was asking last time, uh, Steve was talking about looking for the hungry person to really pour into, looking for the the one who's going to be obedient to the Lord and, and take what they've been given by the Lord and by a disciple like Steve and really put it into practice. But I was also quoting, um, you know, Paul in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, where he says, look for faithful men, but also mm. those who will be able to teach others also. We're trying to mm. figure out how to do that on a college campus. And I was wondering, what is what is the relationship piece 
uh, uh, the faith, the hungry, the faithful piece is obviously step one. It's 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 critical. But then on a college campus, it's such a melting pot of these people groups, these affinity groups, and, and they influence each other so radically. But they've divided themselves up in, in the little groups of, of of common interests and common likes, and the, and and that's their 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 relationships for those two, three, four, five years. And so, um, if you work with a student, for instance, that's not relational, he he or she does not mm-hmm. relate to people. They don't. They're not part of a, a relational group, an affinity group, a people group there on campus. Mm-hmm. They're kind of just a loner. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they can be hungry and obedient, but if they don't really have anybody to pass it on to or not mature enough to be able to do that, mm. should those really be the people we focus on? So I like to, I like to add that, mm. that social relational maturity piece. And they have this network of friends as I'm selecting who I pour into respond to mm. our listener on, on that, if you would, as we get started yeah. on this third episode. Steve. Yeah. I, I think on I, one I, level, if every disciple, every new disciple ought to know uh, Jesus has given them the Great Commission. That's for every believer. And uh, that, that should make us all feel a bit uncomfortable uh, because of the challenge of that great. But what do you do? You don't just disciple. Jesus never disciples. You sit in my classroom, in my lounge room, we'll sit around. Um, you know, whenever he's sitting around teaching his disciples, it's because they've been on mission. So every disciple needs to have the invitation, um, follow Jesus and let's go fishing. Uh, and he'll teach us. Um, but then you'll see, so, so that's just stock standard. Um, you know, I'm discipling a young man at the moment because uh, I'm around. I'm not traveling for a few months. Um, and so at some point I'll say, hey, let's... Let's, let's teach you how to share your story, how to share the gospel, and let's go find someone, and I'll show you how it's done. Um, now, if he's terrified by that, I'm still going to do it because he needs to learn that he, he's got, he's got a, a message for others. But sometimes quiet people get activated by that, and all of a sudden, you because you've trained and mobilized someone, now you really know. Whereas sometimes extro, extroverts, are, are, they're well-connected, but they're afraid of rejection. So look at what people do. But as a leader, as a movement catalyst, you must, if you can imagine a bell curve, you spend some time with every disciple showing them that they're called to the Great Commission. You spend a lot of time with those who are faithful and fruitful that are showing both the faithfulness to stick at the task and and God's using them to teach others also. Mm-hmm. And they're the people who ought to get um, mo- most of your the lion's share of your time. Again, not in the classroom, but you go visit them. Let's, let's go out into your mission field um, or, or you get your Timothys together and I'd love to hear how God's working amongst them. Because, and so you're seeing, are they, are they a multiplier? Because they're the people you should spend a lot of time with to, get la- to launch them. Now, once they're experienced at that level, they become a peer with you. So you spend a lot of time to sort of launch them into that. But once they get there, you won't spend as much time because you're peers. They know as much as you do. Um, and now you're more allies and the bell curve drops off. Does that make sense? You, I mean, you still have time with them. It's just as an intensive, sometimes it's years where you're, you're really helping them to get established and you spend a disproportionate amount of time with them. Any excuse. Um, yeah. And Steve, you talked a little bit about that in the, you know, pioneering, is it pioneering movement? Those yeah. Level, the five, five levels. levels of leaders, you know, and, yeah. and everybody's, everybody's called to be, you know, that level one seat sower, but you just kind of see this it fall off because not everybody's equipped relationally, emotionally, um, or gifted to, to do level, you know, two through five. Yeah, I mean, how many so, Apostle Pauls do you really need? <laughs> and, right. and, and as Paul said, the whole body's not an eye. 
Um, right. But at the same time, every disciple can be a seed sower, a disciple maker, mm -hmm. and faithful in that. Um, and and sometimes, often actually, God sovereignly brings you together with that person. Um, I mean, there's some very good principles in, in how to make sure you find them. Um, but sometimes it's it's a sovereign work of God, um, and 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 that's where you've got to learn. Okay, I'm I'm the outside, alongside sort of coach, encourager, mentor, um, but but they're the player on the field. That's right. That's right. Well, Steve, we've we've talked about. I mean, these past couple episodes, we've talked about movements and and elements of movements and leaders of movements, and and there's been some great applications from that onto a university campus. Um, but in when you talk about in, when you wrote Rise and Fall of Movements in your research, there's actually kind of a life cycle to movements, things that propel movements forward and things that drag movements down. Um, could you talk about what it you know what are some of the things that the birth movements and, and just kind of that mm. first part of that bell curve. Yeah. Well, uh, and I, I had that book drafted for 20 years sitting on my hard drive somewhere before it was really, the Lord had just not opened the doors for it to get published. <laughs> um, and he was waiting for me to have the aha moment when I was reading the stories of Jesus' baptism and wilderness temptation. So those are the transition from his life in Nazareth to the birth of the movement. So everything in those two stories speaks to the identity of the movement, the identity of the Lord Jesus um, in his submission to the Father's will, his obedience to loving obedience to the Word, his dependence on the Spirit, and his commitment to the core missionary task of, of, you know, laying down his life in order that the gospel would go to the nations. Um, so those three things are at the heart. They're the core of the movement of God. And you can find them just in those two little stories. Um, if that's true, then the life cycle isn't just, I'll just pull out some business principles or organizational life cycle principles or sociology or whatever. I learned from all those things. But that's the key to the movement of God is to what degree do we move towards or away from the life and ministry of Jesus? That's, that's the key that unlocks the life cycle. So in that, that birth phase, it's the idea, the vision is born typically in the heart of an individual or, or a group. Um, in Jesus' case, it's, he's, he's come to embody everything God is and, and to bring in his, his kingdom through his life, death, and resurrection. Um, and it's the commitment to that, that identity piece, that, because until someone commits, there is no movement. It's a, right. Movement is a group of people committed to a common cause. So in that birth phase, you, you, God's getting the person right and, and helping them see what the cause is. Um, and that next phase, which we see throughout the Gospels and Acts, is the pioneer is making us turning the vision into reality. So... They don't necessarily know what they're doing. I think Jesus did, but they don't always know what they're doing. But it's like, we're going to commit to this and work it out. Um, and, and a great case study is John Wesley in the Methodist movement that just exploded in the uh, 18th century uh, and then continued for, for many different permutations. It's spun off movements for hundreds of years. But that's where you... You're taking, you're, you're putting the cause to work. This is what we signed up for. This is the heart of what God's doing. This is our mission. Let's go do it. Let's get some results. And people shy away from results, but results are wherever Jesus goes, people's lives are touched. They discover who he is. Um, salvation comes to the house of Zacchaeus. 
and disciples start following him. Jesus is getting outcomes. He's getting results. And he's showing a group of initial leaders, this is how you do it. This is what it's all, not just the strategy piece, but also the identity piece, obedience to the Father, dependence on the Spirit, commitment to the core missionary task. So he's building a movement as he goes, and he's putting in different building blocks, different habits. They have this mobile missionary band. They have people in local places that are forming community. Um, he has the core message. He has the way the message gets out, all of those things. And there's opposition in that phase. Um, so if we were to sort of think about, okay, that's, that's what others have done too, following Jesus' example. They, they, they got that call. And often, you know, Wesley was a broken man when the Lord strangely warmed his heart. You know, he was a failed missionary. And often, you know, the, the danger in that pioneering phase is you, you, you have an affair. You fall in love with another cause or another purpose in your life or, or you just aren't willing to pay the cost. Um, Jesus paid the cost. Uh, for Wesley, you know, God had broken him. And he discovers salvation by grace and, and the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit. And then God calls him to go conquer a nation. To go, He said, I want to go disciple a nation. And he's into that growth phase. The building blocks are all, the, and you'll have to read the rise and fall of movements to know what, what are the building blocks Wesley's doing, building. You know, it's this circuit preaching. He's got a mobile missionary band, just like Jesus did. It's forming people into disciple-making groups. It's, there's a whole lot of building blocks that take some years. Now, what's happening in that phase? We're beginning with a leader or a leadership group very much in charge. They embody, in, in the birth thing, if they got the birth thing right, they embody the movement. So... The danger at that point is we'll just empower everybody to do what they want. You know, let's go baby boomer on them. We'll just help you follow your vision. Um, the vi you've got to be a benevolent dictator. This is who we are and, and we're learning what it is we do in order to get there. So there's a strictness, especially in the early phase. But remember, Jesus got a band of disciples, and Wesley did too, who were watching and learning, guys like Asbury for Wesley. They're going to multiply this thing, but first of all, they're learning its heart. And throughout the growth phase, if it's going to take off, um, it's got to go beyond the span of control of the key founder or founding group. It's not a movement if somebody's in charge. It's a cause. A movement is a group of people committed to a common cause. So are they getting the cause? Are we learning the patterns of how we engage um, the, the strategies and, and, and the like, the methods we use? Uh, are we checking our hearts that, it, it, that, that we're still on track with this, this movement? And so the founder has got to empower the movement to be what he's been embodying, he, she, or they. You know, in the founding group, it could be a founder. Which means there's this yo-yo effect. You let go. <laughs> oh, <laughs> they didn't get it quite right. I'll take it back. You let go, you take it back. You let go. You don't, know, you don't want to let go. And, and at the same time, uh, you, you, you want to let go. Um, and some movements get stuck in that yo-yo effect. Um, there is one very helpful thing is if the founder dies, but that's not for you, Steve, at all. <laughs> well, Steve, Steve, I said, like, before, you, as you listen, talk to them, mm. I think through, like, our, our campus missionaries and church students who have mm. launched movements on their campus. Um, and really, do they just land on that campus with a vision mm and a passion and this radical obedience that I'm going to, we're going to make this happen. I want to see the gospel flag of Jesus planted. And then they do, mm. they gather and students believe these are a little, mm. at some point they have to plant soft vision. And, and Chad, he's probably seen it too, where they mm. 
give it give it to everybody and it dissipates into just the social club or they're super strict and, and we're running with this vision like let's say you talk i could just picture the the pioneering phase of so many different campus ministries um and it's just it's interesting how pioneering a missions movement on a university campus and what we see wesley do or what we see jesus do have so many different so many similarities yeah and you know you can you can release too early and you can hang on too late um and and it's wisdom that that knows knows the difference but the ultimate goal if you want to get to movement is um you start meeting people on that campus or maybe who are from ministries of other campuses that have been started from yours and they don't know your name yes. and you're getting the same the same heart so you, you're diffusing authority and responsibility throughout the movement once everybody's clear this is who we are and what we do um and so uh the goal is that the, the the movement catalyst or the pioneer may still be around, but there's multiple centers of energy that if any one of them fell over, the others would fill the gap um, because they're getting the heart and the patterns and the practices uh, of this whole thing. So so there is it is a it's, I guess it's like raising teenagers. I don't know um, where you know how much hands on, how much hands off. But the end goal is, are people getting the heart of this? And do they know the practices that are fruitful to do? And is it getting beyond our campus? All of a sudden, we've got a Chinese student who's taken it back to their home. Mm. Uh, and they're doing what we do. They learned it here. Um, and now it's popping up in other places. It's, it's when it's popping up in other places that you're beginning to get that movement dynamic. And then the founder, if they're still around, they're cheerleading that right. rather than I've got to keep taking back control or they'll get it wrong. Um, so you start, but that's, you, start hearing, yeah. uh, you start hearing the spiritual DNA that was implemented, repeated back to you, mm. not knowing that the, yeah. you were the person who started it. Yeah. People thinking the yeah. random old guy on campus. Yeah, and if, if you step out of line as the founder, they'll say, wait a minute. This is what we all signed up for. <laughs> you know. Um, where we uh, that's, started that's out. The, and Wesley did that successfully. Yeah, I, the, the study between, say, a contemporary of Wesley like Jonathan Edwards, you know, uh, we, we we think highly of Jonathan Edwards. We, we, we read his, you know, sermons, you know, Sinners in the hands of an angry God, you know, and things. But uh, the the long lasting impact, the multiplication that took place through Wesley versus a Jonathan Edwards is like night and day. And so I appreciate mm. Edwards. I respect Edwards and his preaching and his his teachings. But to study Wesley, I don't think really evangelicals today understand that we can really study the life and ministry of Wesley. To uh, to to really learn some principles of multiplication, principles of scaling, principles of delegation, principles of of discipling in some great ways. And so, our first episode with you, Steve, was just kind of what is a movement. Um, the second episode was what what are the, the the kind of the characteristics of a leader of a movement. But now we're talking about what are the things that kill a movement. What are those things that are obstacles that keep it from really uh, getting established and multiplying, and um, it sounds like um, one of them. You're you're quoting Wesley here. You're you're using him as a as a model. Um, what what is it? What what's the core of, of of Wesley's philosophy of ministry that he was able to have develop something that is still going on hundreds of years later versus mm. another person mm. who had a great ministry, but it it, it just once it's once his lifetime was over, it was pretty much over mm. and dissipated from that point. What what what's the difference mm. in your mind? I think he had a good balance of word, spirit, core missionary task. He held 
those in 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 creative tension in a biblical balance sort of way i think that really helped uh because people will grasp oh it's all about the word but it's the teaching of the word in the service or the seminary for wesley the word is out in public places just like it was in acts and it's the word is on a journey it's driving the narrative of the book of acts on its way to the ends of the earth um, and then he's got a, a, a you know, he's, his children and grandchildren have probably gone further, the Pentecostal movements, the holiness movements, but he had a strong biblical um, understanding of the, the work of the Holy Spirit empowering ordinary people. Um, so they started out um, not very learned, his, his basically young men on horseback doing pioneered church planting and discipleship well they spent the whole rest of their life learning you know they they might have started not having read too many books but they started reading books if they hung around with george john wesley but they were they were learning on the job so but it the moravians were more they were missionary orientated but a little bit more contemplative it's the spirit we wait on him Whereas Wesley's saying, no, the Spirit comes to bear witness to Jesus. Let's get out with the Word. So right. that, that great creative tension that, that, that drove him forward in a purposeful way and then sticking to the, even though we're doing a whole lot of things, we've got orphanages, we've got schools, we've got this, that, and the other, but at the heart of everything is the gospel. It's not on the same, you know, th this is the gospel and we love our neighbors as well. But don't confuse um, social change with the gospel. Um, and so, and and one thing that really helped Wesley and Asbury is lack of communication. Because <laughs> when he anointed a guy, go go go, you know, hundreds of miles away on horseback and just claim that territory for Jesus. Well, he gets to see John Wesley maybe once or twice a year or, or uh, Francis Asbury, you know, when they come together. The rest of the time, he's got to make his own decisions and trust God. <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> no phone calls, no internet, no close supervision. You just got to go do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then every now and again, Wesley would pull him in and check the quality of their life and the fruitfulness of their ministry. So there was accountability. It's just... No one was micromanaging these pioneers. They they were just taking new territory. Um, well, it also I think it, I think it also early on he was actually you know the, the word Methodist the word method is in there. They they were criticized early on because they were using you know, they were using methods as if, as if that was negative, and yet mm. no 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 he was developing very pragmatic reproducible tools and concepts, and now he was preaching and multiplying and scaling those out town by town across the United States. No, the fact that he had methods, that's what established the, the, the scalability of it. It's, it's like when we're, 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 I'm to a point in my life in ministry where unless it is so simple, so basic, so reproducible, so mm. transferable, that's kind of an overriding principle that if, if they can't take what I've given them today and do it tomorrow, it's too complicated. Mm. And so wash, rinse, repeat. Wash, mm. rinse, repeat. Over and over and over yeah. again. I think that's one of the, 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 the beauties of Wesley and what he developed there um, that is still and with us today. It, it, was pro it was pragmatic in one sense. It was pragmatic. But what was the goal he was going for? Because he realized he could preach to thousands and thousands. Not, I mean, Whitfield had like thirty to 40,000, whereas Wesley might have only had five or six. Okay, so he knew he could go anywhere and preach. and get, But he said, I'm not going... If, if he was just a pragmatist, he'd gather that crowd and take up an offering. You know. Um, but he says, I'm not going to go and speak to all those thousands unless I can organize them into disciple-making groups. And so his pragmatism, and he, he learned disciple-making groups from the Moravians. He learned public preaching from, from Whitfield. He brought the two together. 
but he's pragmatic about disciples who then multiply. And that yes. pulls in the circuit preachers, young men on subsistence wages, you know. So he's doing all of that, but he, he has an identity. That's the word, the spirit, the core missionary task. He's got true north, and that's the filter by which he understands pragmatism. In other words, pragmatism is if I can see a godly, disciple-making follower of Jesus, and it was this, this, and this, I'm going to do that because it got my result. Rather than pragmatism, it'll get me money, it'll get me fame, it'll get me a big church. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, Steve, Steve, I know we're we're treading on mm, borrowed time, yeah. time with you, but tell me. So we talked about the birth of movement and the growth, but how mm. there's a point where a movement hits maturity, and that's mm. dangerous. Um, yeah. Tell us about the dangers of a mature yeah. movement. I know that sounds like an oxymoron, but yeah, talk about well, that. Well, yeah. Well, I got another oxymoron for it. It's the failure of success. Mm. And the example I give, I mean, this eventually, you can track it historically, and the Methodists are really good at keeping records. And this is exactly what happened to them. But I'm going to use Peter at Cornelius South. So it's humming in Jerusalem. They've filled the city with the knowledge of Jesus. It's overflowing into Samaria, Galilee, Judea. So the whole of historic Israel is on fire, and Peter is at the center of it. So this is why we call it the failure of success. It's 10 years since the Great Commission was given to go to the nations. What's going on, Peter? So, well, I'm busy. <laughs> you know, that's what's going on, <laughs> trying to stay in front of away from persecution and he's out at least he's out of Jerusalem he got out of the office and he's pushing onto the fringes you know up, up engaging in places that certainly have, uh, there are gent a lot of Gentiles around so at the very point of your success you want to protect that you want to nurture it you want to make sure you know remember at the beginning, in the birth phase, you risked everything in order to get there. Now you're there, you want to protect it. Um, you don't want to take risk. Um, you're getting maybe a bit fuzzy about what was the core missionary task. Uh, and, and this is where the encouraging thing is, that it's discouraged even Peter got there with all his qualifications and training. The encouraging thing is it's not about Peter. It's God who turns him around. And so, because it is the movement of God. And so he turns him around at Cornelius' house. What's happening there? Revisiting, returning to the core vision and the identity piece. And God's opening the eyes. And when they reflect on it all, that this is, yeah, the word has always said light to the nations. Yes, this is what the Spirit's doing. And yes, it aligns with the core missionary task. Let's, you know, Let's all agree and let's go do this now. And Paul's waiting in the wings. But every, so even the movement of God needs renewal. Um, and every movement needs renewal. And you renew by returning, you make an innovative return to your heritage, to the, you know, your identity piece, the word, the spirit, the core missionary task. And then you ask, how do we express that freshly today? But what happens in that maturity time at the top of the bell curve? You've got assets. Hey, some people are getting paid. <laughs> you know, you have offices. You have all sort. You have a a a, a position or a, you know in the community or the church community. People have a perception of you that you need to protect. There's all of these assets that you have are now hurting you because you, you're finding security in your success. And typically what's happening, certainly amongst clergy, is they're getting fuzzy about the gospel. And they're beginning to see, this happened to great movements, they're beginning to see the whole transformation of the culture um, as the core missionary task rather than salvation through Christ. They're redefining those terms. 
um, they're, they're, they're making life hard for the pioneers who are being squeezed out um, silently. They're not being, there's not a bloodbath yet, but it's coming, you know. So partly it's, it's and, you know, it, we don't have to spend too much time time going down the curve but you know just have a look at what's happened to the united methodist church um over you know it's been a it's a great case study because it's uh i don't know more than a couple of hundred years isn't it uh of of decline um and so it happens but god is always you know, there's signs of renewal for those who've broken away and stayed faithful to the scriptures in the Methodist scene globally. You know, there's there's more Anglicans in Nigeria than there are in England. So they've gone down the track of moving away from scriptural norms on marriage and human sexuality. In England, they have. But the vast majority of Anglicans globally who are faithful to the scriptures are outside of England. And they're there because of a movement that was sparked by one pastor by the name of Charles Simeon in the, I think it was 1700s. And he started the Church Missionary Society. It wasn't with any permission, no funding. He just did it. And, and now like three quarters of the world's Anglicans are in the, the parts of the world where the population is growing the fastest. Wow. So it gets awful on the downside to a point where you don't die you just decay on external life support because you have assets you have built every time you sell off a church building because you've closed a church down you you win the lottery you know you got millions of dollars but what's god doing on the fringe he's tapping someone on the shoulder so what's the what's the dream let's get back to what jesus did what the risen lord does in the book of acts why don't we just return to those things? And, and, you know, this is falling over. They've got billions of dollars of assets and investments. You've got nothing. But, hey, you've got the word, the spirit, and the core missionary task. Yeah, that is enough. Yeah. Steve, that is so good. And, and all those, if you haven't picked up a copy of Rise and Fall Movements, guys, um, I'd encourage you to read that. Um, and, and also, it, it applies to, to us as, as campus leaders, as college pastors, um, one of the one of the most dangerous things for us is a room full of college students, um, because then we want to protect the room um, instead of leaning into the spirit, the word, and and what we're supposed to do. Such such good, Steve. Such good. And good I think stuff. one of the one of the case studies in the rise and fall is the student volunteer movement or student yeah. Christian movement. Uh, which started out so strong in the first generation, which we can learn, you guys I'm sure have learned from, but unfortunately lost its way. But a great precedent of mobilizing tens of thousands into world missions. Yes. Well, Shad, Shad, what, uh, in wrapping up, what resonated with you? Just hearing what Steve was talking about. Well, I think a lot of us are in ministry for ourselves. Um, you know, I'm here, how much impact can I have? Uh, how much influence can I, or social media has exacerbated that problem because now we, we're seeing how many followers we can get. Somehow that's the measure of spiritual mm. influence or impact right. or something, but that's not really, you know, when Jesus said, follow me, I don't think he was talking about, you know, so his social media following, you know, <laughs> uh, no, he, 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 and he was all about re reproduction. He was leaving men behind who could take the, the, the message and continue on mm -hmm. to, to apply it. And so I'm hearing that from Steve. I'm hearing his study of the scriptures. I'm hearing his study of history and even our discussion of John Wesley and others. Um, you know, uh, John Maxwell, one of my, I enjoy his leadership books. He says, there's no success without a successor, you know. And, and even the Apostle Paul, you know, we've talked about in our episode, 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, when he says, entrust these to faithful men, that entrust word, it's a banking term, uh, depositing something of great value in another person. Mm -hmm. you know, get, 
can't do it with everyone. I knew one guy said, I'm discipling 20 men. I said, wow, Jesus only did 12. And one of those guys bombed out. You're discipling 20. Very impressive. You know? But but that, that word in trust, I'm, I'm no Greek scholar, Steve. Please know that. But that word in trust, it's in the middle voice. You know, active voice is, is I'm hitting you. Passive voice is you're hitting me. Mm. But middle voice is we're hitting each other. And, and so the idea of it, oh, mm-hmm. you know, Timothy, is get to a point in your discipling where it's not just all oh, I am the teacher and you are the student. Oh, mm-hmm. no. No, it becomes where you're reproducing yourself so much. You, you, you have reproduced yourself where now it's, it's a partnership. It's a, it's a give and take. It's a, I'm learning from you and you're learning from me. And you, you touched on that. You touched on that, what you were sharing earlier, mm-hmm. I think. And so um, this idea of, of reproducing yourself, leaving others behind, knowing when to pass the baton of leadership to someone, uh, that takes some wisdom, some humility. Um, and, and so I guess those are things that you observe, you know, movement by movement, and that can be a movement killer. If the leader of that movement wants to hang on to that role, hang on to that leadership, is not willing to give away authority, give away responsibility, give away influence, that's going to kill the movement. Um, and so he really, from day one, needs to work himself, start working himself out of a job from day one. Anyway, those are some thoughts uh, that 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 I was, as Steve was sharing, was wrapping around in my little brain about leadership, about multiplication, what's happening on a college campus, even this idea of succession of leaders and founders, apostolic leaders, uh, how, how does that work? So anyway, I, I was um, pontificating there a little bit. must be my Catholic background. So. No, Chad, I appreciate that. And Chad, you, you've, uh, we could look at the number of movements that you've started and, and hand it off to people. So I'm grateful for leadership and the example of the, the next generation of leaders. So I appreciate you, Chad. Um, and Steve, I, I cannot articulate enough how grateful we are that you would spend, uh, these three episodes with us. Uh, thank you. It's going to, I've got a, I was taking notes I, and I'm going to have to listen to this again and finish up my notes. Cause it was just so good. Um, and so thank you for being a part of what we're doing and friends. Thank you guys for listening. Well, um, thank you guys for, for joining us and, and trying to reach the college campus impact a generation with the gospel. Um, keep doing what you're doing meeting with students, going out in the harvest field, sharing the gospel, making time to develop leaders, um, and be open-handed and send them to the nations. Um, we, we can do this. We can impact this generation. If we'll set our minds to it. And so I'm grateful for you, and thanks for tuning in. Yeah, it's been fantastic to have you with us, Steve. We This is the third of, of three episodes with Steve Addison, and he's kind of the guru of movements around the world, in my opinion. And so Go, go to Amazon and, and get his his his, his kind of his classic. The early one is is just called "Movements That Change the World," and the five keys of a movement are just 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 they're epic. And then he wrote "Jesus Start" is is number two, and number three the pioneering movements. There there are five or six that he's got all together, but those three, please get those, read those, and just soak them in and say, Lord. How does this apply to my life? How does this apply to my ministry? Uh, am I really doing the ministry the way Jesus did? Am I really multiplying? Am I just having a ministry or am I having a movement? And try to understand the difference between those two things and maybe even start to transition from just having a ministry to a movement. And I think Steve's writings could help you do that. So it's great to have you, brother. Thank you. Uh, so be, be sure to join us for each episode of Campus Ministry today with Clayton and myself. And we want to, uh, we're going to be hearing from other awesome speakers. We're going to start lighting up some individuals who will be speaking and leading workshops at EDM 25, uh, which is the, the, the conference hosting uh, May 6th through the 9th, 2025 in Fort Worth, Texas. We're making room for 1,600 this time, church-based and campus-based collegiate ministry workers. Yep. We're going to all be focused on evangelism, disciple making, and missions mobilization. So please go there, get information, uh, register, bring boatloads of your staff with you. We will make room, I promise. 
And be sure to subscribe to this, this podcast. Visit viastudents.org for more tools and resources in college ministry. So until next time, God bless.